Hey everybody, this is Scott Arnell, and welcome to this episode of the SRI 360 podcast, where in every episode I interview world-class, sustainable, and responsible investors, executives, or entrepreneurs who are driving positive change in the world while achieving market returns. And I do this in order to bring you the lessons that they've learned along the way from their investment activities and their experiences, and to find out what they are actually doing and how they are doing it so that you can have better insights into the different SRI investing strategies that are actually being done today and what they're actually doing right now and doing it across many different asset classes. And hopefully this will help you invest in a more purposeful way and to invest for positive impact for a better world through your investment activities. Today, I'm speaking with Amy Novogratz and that's spelled N-O-V O-G-R-A-T-Z. And Amy is a co-founder of Aquaspark, which is a global investment fund based in Utrecht in the Netherlands that invests in companies with the objective of developing a sustainable, optimal food system all along the aquaculture value chain. Amy brings almost two decades of experience in fostering collaborative solutions to some of the world's biggest challenges. Prior to co-founding Aquaspark, she helped launch the Social Policy Action Network, and later on, she developed and produced Chat the Planet, which was a web and television entity that bridged young people globally. She later served as director of the TED Conference's annual TED Prize for nearly a decade. Throughout her career, Amy has led more than 20 global collaborations across a broad spectrum of sectors, including healthcare, education, science, technology, conservation, art, and activism. And she currently serves on the boards of eFishery, Energia and Expert C. So today we will be discussing the aquaculture industry and the need to transition the industry into a healthier, more sustainable and accessible food supply. We will discuss Aquaspark's theory of change, which is built around investing in businesses up and down the aquaculture food chain in order to build out a new ecosystem around sustainable fish farming. We'll get insights into the importance of the aquaculture industry in a world where two thirds of the world depends on fish as their major source of protein and the need for sustainable technology and practices to take the pressure off the world's oceans. We discuss why investing in sustainable, low footprint fish farming that produces healthy protein in a way that's balanced with the environment should be considered impact investing. Amy describes their ecosystem approach to portfolio management and how they identify investment targets and the decision-making process that they use to select their investments and manage technology risk. And she walks us through a couple of investments they have made that demonstrates their strategy and practice. We speak about AquaSpark's shared values manifesto that they require all portfolio companies is assigned before they invest to make sure that everyone is on the same page about their vision for aquaculture and it identifies some of what she calls social musts that they require of their portfolio companies. Amy discusses their fund's returns and a new fund that they're raising that will be focused on aquaculture investments in sub-Sahara Africa and we cover a whole lot more in what turned out to be a far-reaching conversation on a pretty important subject. You can find Amy on LinkedIn and on the internet at aqua-spark.nl She is on Twitter at Aquaspark Impact and on Facebook at Aquaspark.nl. I very much enjoyed my conversation with Amy. I found it super insightful and I think you will enjoy it too. And now, please meet Amy Novogratz. You are living in Utrecht, but from your accent, it doesn't sound like you grew up there. So my partner is Dutch, but I am in New York. And up until the pandemic, we were living here and the office was here, but we setting up Aquaspark, we traveled like 70% of the time. So I hadn't really spent that much time in the Netherlands until uh, about 18 months ago, where I really get Dutch life now. And you said you were raised in New York, and I think you went to undergraduate at your education in theater, is it right? I was raised in Washington, D.C. area, and I went to New York for yeah. school. And I studied theater and literature initially, but wanted to direct and produce and literature, a double major. And then when you got out, then you were producing content? Well, no. So I was really excited about doing activist theater. But after being there for a while, I still have a great love of kind of storytelling and putting pieces together. But it felt too indulgent and it was different than I had assumed it would be or the world I was in. So I actually took a direct turn from there to work at a think tank and got into social policy work in Washington. So moved in to a think tank just as an assistant to two policymakers, a social policy analyst and an environmental one. 
and ended up after a year there leaving with a social policy analyst to start something called SPAN, which is the Social Policy Action Network. Kate yeah. Sylvester had been a journalist for her, most of her career and then was really frustrated that journalists and policymakers never really connected. They never connected with the academics or the research and the recipients were never a part of that conversation. It was just the two of us starting up this organization that did some pretty cool work around changing, you know, what laws around welfare with child pregnancy. We shifted the policy in Massachusetts and then it got adopted nationally, did things with early childhood development. And I mean, again, like I, I liked putting pieces together, facilitating yeah. conversations. I learned a ton and had made a great ton of contacts in the foundation world and the policy mm-hmm. world with her. And really, though, felt like the real answer is changing culture, changing how we think about things, like making this message bigger. So went back to New York and started getting involved in something called Chat the Planet. It was a South African oh. television show that connected young people in South Africa with young people in different parts of the world. It is a great show from Johannesburg to Northern Ireland talking about how do you know difference if you can't see it. It did really well in South Africa and we got really excited about it and tried to package it for an American audience for a few years and were told over and over that Americans didn't care about the rest of the world and it would never work in America. And then 9-11 happened and we had treatments. We had a few like small little pilot videos. It got fully funded by someone in Link TV, which was Al Gore's old satellite channel, agreed to air. (laughs) And so worked on this, produced a web and TV entity called Shot the Planet for a few years. That was kids in the U.S. talking to kids in Baghdad before the war and after the war. Kids in the U.S. talking to kids in Jordan around sexuality. In Germany around how you forgive your past. Like way ahead of their time, MTV ended up adopting pieces of it and turning it into kind of MTV University content. I worked with Link TV to do a user-generated channel. This is like pre-YouTube, young yeah. people submitting stories. And then I found TED and was just like, oh, whoa, whoa, this is where everything comes together. It was 2004 yeah. before TED was online. It was just this conference of ideas and people doing stuff with ideas. And started the TED Prize at TED in 2004. And it was this amazing opportunity to present ideas to this group of people who could get put resources and including, you know, their own time and thinking around this idea to bring something to fruition. And it worked in healthcare and SETI space exploration with Jamie Oliver in the food revolution, uh, about 15 different uh, sectors in different areas and started working in 2010 with Sylvia Earle on the ocean and creating awareness around the need to protect the ocean. Brought an expedition of 100 people to the Galapagos with Sylvia to educate them around the ocean in order to do more. And met my partner on this boat, who is an entrepreneur, and we talked about what we wanted to, wanting to do something together. And the ocean was our shared space. It was our only shared network. He was living in the Netherlands at the time I was in New York. And we basically, after a while, dropped off Aquaspark. So that was your road from studying theater to producer into finance, into VC. Yes, we are investing. I mean, we are for fund. And we're just under 250 million right now, Euro, but in 22 companies. But when I saw aquaculture, I mean, I know I have a partner that is finance driven and finance savvy. I know how to hire teams that do things that I don't. What I do is help grow ideas and grow businesses and connect, engage people inside new ideas. And when I looked at aquaculture, what it needed was coordination. It needed a new message. It needed alignment around message. It needed transparency. It needed people to think of it differently and different types of stakeholders to get involved. I mean, yes, it needed an investment, but in order to get investment, it needed all these other things. And you founded AquaSpark in 2011, is that right? Yeah, I mean, we launched it in 2014, but we started to build okay. it in 2011. Most of my discussions with investment managers are somewhat straightforward, and we talk about what their investment focus is and what their investment universe is and how they manage risk and what they benchmark against. And and how they select investments and so on. But it seems to me what you're doing is really different in a lot of ways from most. And it's all very interesting, but there's a lot here in doing the research that I don't understand. So I want to make sure I understand it by the time we finish today, 
But maybe to start out with, you could just tell me, in your words, like what your role is, because you have a co-founder, your partner at AquaSpark, and how do you describe, maybe at this point, just at the 30,000 foot level, what is it that you do versus your partner? I mean, we really do everything together. We manage this team together. We build the portfolio together. But I think if you had to separate us, I'm more kind of around vision, around partnerships, around the message we get out there around, I've come up with the idea of Invest Aqua, an event we have a reporting series that I'm launching. Mm-hmm. Like, though I work really closely with the companies and I'm very close to building the portfolio and a number of boards, my like big contribution to AquaSpark is this whole ecosystem of everything else that supports the investments. Can you just give me a high level overview of AquaSpark, what your mission is, maybe sure. at the 10,000 meter level for now, just to frame everything you'll be speaking about today? AquaSpark, we're an investment fund dedicated to sustainable aquaculture with the mission of moving aquaculture into an industry that's more sustainable, more accessible, and healthier. If you look at, you know, fish, the demand for fish and protein, it's going up at a pretty steep curve. We can't get more from the oceans than we currently are. That's agreed upon mm-hmm. by all of the experts. Our oceans are already overfished. Some areas are really depleted. The only way we're going to meet that demand with fish is through aquaculture. And aquaculture can actually be a really great solution, but we have to do it right. So our reason for being is to show that you can do aquaculture really right. And it can actually have returns that are comparable to how we're doing traditional aquaculture now in order to create a blueprint from which to scale aquaculture. Are you just trying to hit more or less the same financial benchmarks or do you see it as a competitive advantage? We do see it as a competitive advantage. The problem is, is it's not always that easy right now to choose true sustainability because we don't have, for instance, alternative feed ingredients at scale. We don't yeah. have great means of battling disease. So there's a reason for a lot of kind of crappy practices. It's because we haven't scaled these solutions. Even so, yes, in, in aquaculture more than ever, because fins are, fish are so sensitive to their environment, doing yeah. the right thing actually produces much better results in the long term. It's just that it's hard for a lot of aqua farmers to do the right thing because they don't have access to what they need to do so. Do you consider yourself a VC or a private equity? We are an equity investor that people typically categorize as venture. We're a completely constructed model just for aquaculture. It's much easier to understand us if you think of us as a holding company. We're a long-term model. We don't strive for exits. We get in early and we stay in and continue to follow on for as long as it makes sense. So in some companies, we've already followed on four or five rounds at this point. We have a dividend model. So we're not easy to categorize, but we're often categorized as venture. So you're not a fund per se. The investment goes into a holding company. We are officially a fund. We're a Dutch cooperative. It's easier to think of when you think of us as a holding company because we're an open-ended fund with this long-term vision. Could you give me just a little primer or a background on the aquaculture industry and like what are the macro trends driving the sector? Yeah, and it's really around, you know, where our fish is coming from, where our seafood is coming from, because the wild cod is completely tapped out. Also, with climate change and oceans warming, I mean, if you look at what just happened in BC, was it 100 million animals died in the water with the temperatures rising that high? Aquaculture can be a really controlled, resilient, productive way to, to produce fish. And you can do it really efficiently. It can be done more efficiently than any other animal protein. The thing is, there are, I think, 700 species of aquaculture being farmed. A lot of them seaweed, so it's not all animals. A lot is, you know, sea plants as well. We just invested in a big seaweed company. We actually think embracing that diversity is a priority. We don't want it to be chicken, chicken, and chicken. There are, you know, there's land-based systems. There are open ocean. You see the kind of the net pens out in the sea that are open. There's pond aquaculture. So there are tons of different species, tons of different systems. The fish that's most produced is carp, but that's China, and it's not really a globally traded fish. If you look at kind of aquaculture species that are the most valuable and the biggest that people are investing in or investing around right now, it's shrimp, it's salmon, and it's a number of smaller species that have really valuable markets like Arctic char, barramundi. 
when we first got in 2011 or so, there was very little technology in aquaculture whatsoever. It's a very opaque, literally, like you can't even see through the water in most cases, but also no data. It goes back, you know, thousands of years, really. But uh, commercially, it's probably like the 70s that it started in Norway. And it's still really in its early years. But technology in the last five years has gone from non existing at all to really, you're seeing, we by the end of next year, we'll have our first unicorn in aquaculture, a tech company that is bringing transparency, efficiency, financing, access to market to farmers in Indonesia. It's what got us so excited about aquaculture was that there's so much low hanging potential there with technology, with data, with like making it more traceable. There's a desire to do the right thing for most aquaculture because they benefit from it. And we were seeing over and over cases where doing the right thing actually became much more profitable for the farmer. I mean, this case of this Indonesian technology, farmers that just use the feeding machine that feeds fish and shrimp only when they're hungry based on sensor, that piece increases profits by like 50%. And we were seeing that across the board. So aquaculture tech right now is hot. Feed is a big challenge around sustainability. I mean, you'll probably hear over and over that it makes no sense to farm fish because we feed farm fish wild caught fish for a while. And then it was greatly replaced by soy like a decade or so ago. Soy is not a great alternative either. So looking at alternative feed ingredients, we're invested in microbes, we're invested in insects. We see seaweed playing a role there. But alternative feed, if, if we need to triple aquaculture production in the next two to three decades, the stats say that we actually need eight times more feed than we're currently producing. So it's mm. like three rainforests worth of soy that we're going to need just to feed farmed fish. It's a massive opportunity and it's really capital intensive. But you're seeing a lot of kind of the big players enter the space through feed. Technology, as I said, is taking off in a big way. Disease, yeah. in battling disease, it's one of the big challenges in aquaculture. It's just starting to gain a little traction. And I think it'll happen really fast because what we've learned about disease in the last decade is a lot. Technology can play a role there with sensors and whatnot. We have a bacteriophages mm-hmm. company that allows us to eliminate antibiotics from farming, which yeah. is another big problem in aquaculture. Now, he touched on so many things here. So first of all, what percentage of food protein, I don't know if you discuss it like that, is fish versus, let's say, meat? Two-thirds of the world depends on fish as their major source of protein. So aquaculture is bigger than wild-caught fish already for human consumption, and it is yeah. bigger than beef as well. Just aquaculture, right. not fish. And aquaculture and wild-caught fish are about... like. Aquaculture just surpassed it. So maybe it's 51%, 49%. They're close. And beef and aquaculture is bigger than beef. So fish is two times larger than beef. You mentioned some technology that feeds fish when they're hungry. How do fish put up their hand and say, hey, I'm hungry? They move more or less based on when they're hungry, they move a lot. When they're satiated, they're calm. (laughs) <laughs> Not so different than humans. <laughs> so it's, it's algorithms that detect water movement and it saves 24% of feed each cycle. Feed is like 80% of the cost of a lot of farms. It's most of the operating cost is feed. So it's a massive mm-hmm. economic difference. But also the fish health stuff comes from overfeeding, underfeeding, the environmental you mm-hmm. know, pollution, the waste. It's all connected. It feeds a big piece of aquaculture. You referred to crappy practices. I think that was the technical term in aquaculture. I think you mentioned disease and the feed. Are there other main issues? How we stock animals, putting too many fish in a pen, overstocking. So the density of stocking is one thing. Water quality is big. The actual feed ingredients, so not just when and how you feed a fish, but also what you feed them is a big one. There are different issues in salmon and shrimp. It's the open ocean um, aquaculture escapes is a big one. The lack of transparency and traceability are both really big as well. Mm -hmm. Not knowing how your fish was produced, not knowing where it came from, not even really knowing what species it is, not knowing where the fish meal came from, was slavery attached. It's a complex industry when you start to dig down. But the, the environmentally, the kind of the big ones to solve are feed, efficiencies, disease, 
and kind of pollution, water quality slash pollution. Right. I guess it probably happened over a period of time, but you saw this opportunity in aquaculture, but how did you get the vision for it? How did you come around to it, I suppose? In thinking to what could a business be that would have an impact on the ocean's health, you think yeah. there's plastics and what could you do there? And some people, our thought was you, well, you stop using them is what you do there. And then there's ocean acidification, which is climate change. It's hard to think mm. through a business model. To us, the thing that we could have had kind of the biggest effect is if you look at how much we depend on the ocean for fish and looking at commercial fishing practices and how much we're damaging the ocean through how we take and what we take. And if you start to realize how miraculous it is that the ocean can regenerate itself, if you give it space and if you look at marine protected areas that really are truly protected, they come back with kind of more life than ever before. And so just the idea of taking pressure off of the ocean was something that we were interested in. And my partner, we started to look at aquaculture. We couldn't get over how big it was, how chaotic it was. I mean, the fact that it was almost as big as wild caught at the time, bigger than beef. It, like, it was shocking that we knew so little about it. And the, one of the big aha moments, my partner was at a meeting of conservationists and somebody was saying, look, We've all said aquaculture is bad. We've all said like we shouldn't let it happen, but actually it could be the solution we're looking for. We mm-hmm. need to support it. We need to do it right. And that was a big moment of conservation is in a room together saying, how do we get behind aquaculture? And then I think when we started to dig, we got to know the industry quite well. And the industry was really generous with inviting us in and giving us information and came up with kind of our theory of change that if you start to invest in the solutions with the idea that you're building the full system, that itself can change, like redesign a system and create a new way of doing things. How do you describe sustainable fish farming and when is it not sustainable? I think one of the reasons we started AquaSpark is because we saw a couple of great models of like, real sustainability and they weren't commercially viable at all. Like there was a farm in the US that was you know, making its own feed Mm. from insects, from algae. And they were doing things really in a very cool way, but they were selling it to, I think, the San Francisco farmer's market or whatnot for like three times the market price of that fish. But what we got excited about was the fact that it was possible to grow things that way. I mean, so if you look at some of our farms, and we have an Arctic char farm in Iceland. It's Iceland, so it's all geothermal energy. So it's easier to do something land-based because... Again, it's all geothermal, a really clean water source. It's in the volcanic rock, so it's a constant flow through system. So you don't need to treat the water. It's always clean. The char, because of the system and because of the species, you can produce a kilo of char for less than a kilo of feed. So a a Mm -hmm. one-to-one feed conversion ratio is pretty sustainable. Right now, the farm is mostly using like byproduct remains waste for fish meal, which is good. Mm -hmm. We think like real sustainability is going to be a really green feed, feed primarily, I said it before, insects, microbes, seaweed. We should need to feed fish something that, you know, we could eat ourselves and it should be something that's easy for the fish to consume. That's not competing with kind of land and water use, but it's non-polluting. It's healthy fish. It's fish that was harvested in a in a kind of animal friendly way or a friendlier way and thinking through kind of the welfare of the animal as you're farming them is an important component for us. We have about eight components that we look at around sustainability and it's feed, it's efficiencies, it's animal welfare, it's how you treat disease. And right now we need to feed a sick animal antibiotics, but Mm. in farming, a lot of farms are using antibiotic as a preventative measure, which makes zero sense. And also we think like if we're going to move into the future, we cannot use antibiotic and farming, especially at the level we are now. Solving yeah. that piece is a big piece for us. But even our disease kind of theory, a bunch of it's preventative. If you feed the animal when they're hungry and feed them accurately, they have a much better immune system. So it's a really holistic approach. And these eight points, that's why it's impact? I mean, you can understand why you, someone might say, why is fish farming impact? If you look at a clean, resource-efficient, low-footprint way to produce a healthy protein to feed people and that they can afford, like I, 
I think food security and the food security that's in balance with our environment yeah. and that works with nature is probably one of the biggest challenges we have right now. So how to, how to invest in a real system that's going to be able to do that because we don't have it now. This is building a system, yeah. building kind of a new version of an industry. Does the industry get in trouble with, I don't know, groups like PETA or anything like that? Because it seems like there's people pushing back on all kinds of things. I mean, at the end of the day, you're still killing fish. Is there anything like that for aquaculture or not? I'm, I'm sure there is. We work with a number of industry groups that are all uh, really aligned around trying to create a more socially just and environmentally yeah. friendly industry. But yeah, for sure there must be. You are still killing fish, and we now have ways where we can harvest them in pain free. We have a company from Scotland that has an yeah. electric stunner that harvests fish in a really, like, in as cruel as possible, in the least possibly cruel way you could imagine. <laughs> but there's a question like, do we all become vegan, and is that better? I'm not sure that's better environmentally. But yeah. I also know that if you look at who's eating fish and where it's coming from, these are markets where we don't have whole foods. Tell me when we're going to get, you know, fake meat products down to a point where they're cost accessible or they're affordable for the rural communities in Mozambique where we have tilapia farms. I, I, I don't think that the answer of we should all be vegan. I personally, for the record, am vegan, but I just yeah. feel like if you're looking at developing more equal worlds, having rich, nutritious sources of food available to all of us feels pretty vital. Rockefeller did a big piece around the best nutrition piece that we need to develop, you know, human health and, and human brain power. And fish yeah. is on the top of that chart. In terms of the sustainable aquaculture industry, who are the main players and where does AquaSpark fit into that? Are there other strategies out there like yours? Or? We're still one of the only kind of dedicated investment funds for sustainable aquaculture, but we're seeing a lot more kind of Come on the horizon. And we're seeing a lot of blue economy funds that have aquaculture prominently featured. You look at kind of Credit Suisse and what they've launched with at their oceans mm -hmm. fund. They're looking at aquaculture as one of the kind of subsectors there. I think most of the industry isn't quite there yet, but they realize that we can't have the future can't look like where we were yesterday, and especially when it comes to fish production. So there's a lot of interest in kind of figuring out how to move in this direction. A number of the Kind of DFIs and sovereign wealth funds are starting to join in on the aquaculture conversation and investment area, but we're co-investors with Tomasic and quite a few companies now. And a lot of the big conglomerates that have kind of food as a part of them and anything fish related are starting to, like, you know, the production issues are not resolved, but we're a lot closer than we were a decade ago. And you're just seeing more and more interest enter the space. Now, you mentioned the ecosystem approach to portfolio management. So who are you investing in? And you know, I'm trying to get down now. How are you actually executing this vision, this strategy? So we invest in farming operations. We invest in technology to make them more efficient, more transparent. Mm -hmm. We invest in disease battling. We invest in feed ingredients. We invest all the way to the market in consumer facing products. We invest all over the world. I mean, part of our vision is around a globally connected aquaculture industry. So I think out of our 22 companies, we're in 16 countries. Yeah. We've also invested in cell-based aquaculture. I mean, we're really investing in you know, a future where we will have seafood on our plate in a way that doesn't put our environment at harm. We're investing in this vision that we'll have a future where we have seafood and fish protein on our plate in a way that doesn't put us out of balance with nature. So then I referenced that in the connection to a cell-based aquaculture company as well. Did you have a ticket size you look for when you're making an investment? We, roughly? we officially on our website say anywhere from 250,000 to 5 million initially, but our, our typical for initial investment is closer to between two and a half million to five, but we have much larger tickets. I mean, I think our largest investment was 14 million initially. And if you look at our approach around following on, we typically were always minority investors. We want to be between mm -hmm. 20 and 49 percent owner, and we want to stay at that ownership for as long as it makes sense. So we continually follow on and keep our shareholding if we can. Do you take technology risk when you're investing or are these all established technologies? 
I mean, we like to say that, you know, it's beyond proof of concept, but mm. the truth is like when we invested in eFishery, this Indonesian company, they were producing one by hand in the basement of their office a day, outsourcing production mm. and scaling it up. It was a massive technology risk. And just in general, technology and aquaculture is a risk in itself because we're not at a place where adoption is that normal. Of a, you know, tech adoption is that is happening that quickly. But we prefer not to take that technology risk, but because we're early investors and because we're trying to change the industry, we typically don't. Could you describe for me, like logistically or tactically or operationally, how do you identify your targets and how do you actually select an investment and make your investment decision and your screening process, your due diligence process? I mentioned being out on the road for the first five years, six years, but we, now we have a team of 22. We believe very much in kind of the power of a network. We have 60 aquaculture experts within our portfolio. We've invested in an accelerator that has, mm. I think, 50 aquaculture startups in it. Um, we mm. have a deal flow team of two and we do a lot to promote the idea of what's possible in aquaculture. So we do a lot of press, a lot of conferences, a lot of events, all to say that we get quite a bit of deal flow submitted from our experts, our partners, and just cold submitted to us. And we have about uh, 1,500 companies that we keep in our pipeline at all times to track, to know the industry, see how it's changing. We form relationships with a lot of those companies. And when we find that they're investable and they're ready for the right stage for us, we start those conversations. But, you know, the first thing we look at is what is this company solving? Is it one of the big challenges in aquaculture? Does it fit into our ecosystem? Is it something we're missing now? Something that nobody else is addressing on that same mm. turf? And is it something that will benefit, like add to the ecosystem and something that the companies inside the portfolio will benefit from as well? So those are the first things, like those are the absolute checkpoints. Who a team is, how they work, how they think, how aligned they are is imperative to us. We get to know the team yeah. quite well. We have a pretty strict, stringent due diligence process here with a really lengthy sustainability checklist. We always send one of at least one or two of our relevant experts to do on-site due diligence with us. Pre-going on-site, we do a couple of different stages of getting to know the company, interviews, references, and then we sign a term sheet. Where most groups kind of sign term sheets all the time, we want to know that if all turns out to be true, that we're going to make this investment. So we always sign a term sheet with the real intention to invest. And yeah. at that point, we do on-site due diligence and bring experts. At the end of the day, if the team really believes in the opportunity still, we create an investment committee packet and we present it to our IC, which is nobody from the team. It's actually made up of all investors, including one board member investor. And they have the final say. But again, it already has our vote because we wouldn't bring anything that we weren't fully behind but the yeah. IC makes the final decision. I read somewhere you have something called the Shared Values Manifesto and that yeah. you require all your portfolio companies to sign it. Can you tell me about that? When I talk to companies where, you know, they say that they didn't have the right investor or whatnot, like just, it's a little crazy that people can start a relationship without really knowing who the other person is. And so it has a couple of purposes behind it. But one is basically to put all your cards on the table and ask them to do the same thing by signing it or not signing it. This is why we exist. This is what we care about. This is what we want to work on. And this is how we plan to work on it. It lays out the vision of where we think aquaculture can be. It lays out ideas around collaboration, sharing knowledge, agreeing to promote ideas together. It has some more practical things in it, like what it means to be a part of an ecosystem portfolio and the idea that if your colleague portfolio company is selling something that you'll look there first and you, you should always get the best price. But if they offer the best price, you should probably go with your portfolio company. With a number of our companies, we have most favored nations agreements as well, meaning that actually their colleague portfolio companies have a special deal to the product that they have in the market, the best price that they have in the market. And in general, it's really signing up for a way to, to build together. We also have a number of kind of social musts in there as well. Every employee must be paid a living wage. We have things around gender and diversity and your commitment, what your company stands for. So it's value-based as well. 
we ask everyone in the management team and usually I think every co-investor and investor that comes in alongside us also signs it. I mean, it's like a three or four page document. I think it's four pages. And most yeah. companies look at it and say, well, this is a no brainer. Like that's why we're here. And it's like, oh, well, that, that kind of tells us something. It's a big first step. It's a part of the shareholding agreement, except I think in the U.S. it's always a side letter just because of how shareholding agreements work in the U.S., but everywhere else it's in the shareholding agreement. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, you have a bit of a focus on Sub-Sahara Africa. Is that true? We're launching a fund focused on Sub-Saharan Africa. Right now huh. we see that it's Sub-Saharan Africa as a part of the whole map where we're investing everywhere. And I think we only have two investments there now, but we're actually launching a subsidiary Aquaspark okay. Africa by the end of this year that will focus okay. on Sub-Saharan. So there and some other places you're at, these are sometimes countries where there's not a whole lot of transparency by the nature of the way they're run or and there's corruption and, well, the rule of law isn't always the rule. How do you deal with due diligence with your investments in those kind of environments? We find companies that see the potential for a different way of doing business that are transparent, right. that have data. And typically... We often, when we're investing in any geography that's new to us, we find a co-investor that is from the region so that it can help us assess through cases and what we might not know. And typically our network is usually connected to regions that we invest in. So we always have a lot of support. We usually hire a local law firm. In some countries where there's going to higher risk. We house the company, we domicile it in a more neutral place for doing business. So mm -hmm. for instance, our Indonesian company is actually domiciled in Singapore. You know, our company mm -hmm. in Mozambique, our farm there is domiciled in Mauritius. Let's think of happy things. Could you just describe one real life investment transaction that demonstrates your strategy, part of your portfolio? And how you identified them, what they do. We'd been talking a lot about how technology was really going to transform aquaculture. You knew it, it, it had to. And people would ask for examples, and there were very few examples of any kind of technology out there in most of aquaculture. And the examples that were there were unaffordable for most farmers. But we were convinced that there was going to be some kind of, you know, like a data-driven aquaculture revolution. The CEO of Evie Fishery, Gabra and Alfredi, was actually at a business competition in Rotterdam. Like it has some boxing terminology. It came to our attention because he was in Rotterdam. We were out of the country at the time. One of my colleagues met him and was really impressed by him. I was in Thailand with Mike and he said, well, I'm going to go to Thailand for my honeymoon soon. So we ended up like meeting him at a bar in Bangkok. And we sat in this dark basement bar and it was just too good to be true, telling us about his technology and what it does. They had 97 units in the field and we couldn't get over like what the, he was saying that they were able to do and the price point that he was selling it. It really did feel like it was going to be the transformation of aquaculture. When we spoke to some of his uh, clients, they were ecstatically happy with the results. They loved working with Gabron. We got to know him quite a bit just through interactions during the Bangkok visit. A colleague mm -hmm. then went to Indonesia and visited farms, got to know the whole company, got to know Gabron. We brought experts on board there. We still started with a very small investment because it was really like, again, we had an outsourced production we knew they were really good at creating this community feel and he was really good at selling. But again, there were less than 100 units in the field. And we had told our investors that we're, you know, we invest past proof of concept and we don't take much technology risk. It was, this was one of our first investments. We found an Indonesian co-investor, a VC from Jakarta, who had never invested in aquaculture, but knew the tech space really well. And they got excited about the opportunity with us. When we brought it to our IC, even though I think we initially invested 250, I think it was trenched out. I think our initial investment was 500, but in two trenches of 250, we often do when they haven't reached certain milestones yet. This was 2015, and this was pre-Series A, which is early for us. But again, we'd been looking for technology since we'd like started to build the pipeline. We'd seen 
only two other companies out there that could do anything close to this. And they were both, you know, 20 times the price for the farmer. If you looked at kind of smallholders in Indonesia, where there are four and a half million fish farmers, it just didn't feel like that was what they were looking for. So yeah, we made this investment and then we actually had a really hard time commercializing production, ordering equipment from China, knowing what you needed. Everything kept getting stuck, finding the right factory to produce. They ended up basically building their own interim factory that was part them, part somebody else. It was not an easy road, but the whole time the entrepreneurs were like just dependable and creative in their thinking. I mean, those two qualities. And also I think, and I think maybe it's because they were younger listeners. So open to collaboration, but remain focused, but really listen to advice, learn from other people. Gabron did an unbelievable job of finding mentors and engaging mentors. I get really yeah. frustrated with companies that don't know how to engage help. There's, these are massive, big problems. Like learn how to bring people in and got really excited by how they brought people in. With them, we brought in, I think it was Winrock and USAID to trial it internationally and trialed it in Bangladesh and in Thailand, funded by those two groups. We brought in a couple of different partnerships. We connected them with IDH around looking at how you detect for disease. Cut to like three years later, Series A, we were starting to really show themselves. They were, I don't know how many farms they were in at the time, but you saw the pattern where a farmer had one unit and then a farmer would buy 10 units. And then in the next cycle, a farmer would buy 100 units. So you saw that the farmers were really valuing the product. Sales were taking off. And you also saw the tremendous impact with feed savings, with reduced pollution, and with profitability. In their Series A, we brought in a number of different partners and bigger investors and a much more global mix of investors. And they started to realize, including a really great VC from Singapore that helped greatly, but they started to realize that technology wasn't really what farmers were looking for. Farmers were looking for to access to market and access to financing. And so they had this feed tech that really, really optimized production practices, all data driven, but they launched with it a marketplace and a financing platform. They closed their Series B in the middle of last summer with North Star with Go Ventures, with like really big tech investors. And now we haven't announced it yet, but this month they're closing their Series C with the biggest tech investors in the world, none of whom have ever been in aquaculture before. My partner did a podcast recently and he is a Korean business guy who has a podcast. When he was looking at the ag tech space, he was traveling to Indonesia and he ran into this company and they mentioned that they had just gotten investment from us. And he was like, who in the hell would invest in this like dinky company in Indonesia <laughs> producing these things in a basement? It was a funny moment. And he was like, man, I wish I had listened to you guys. He said, but I've been curious about who you were ever since then. But it's just that he was solving one of the biggest problems in aquaculture. And he was solving it from the perspective of somebody that understood the industry and was listening to the industry. And yeah. I can tell you lots of reasons why like this company has done better than almost any other tech company in this space. But it's really going to be like, I can't wait till the whole story comes out of where they are now. And a lot I can't say yet. A major kind of success story of what happens when you're human centric and you deal with a real challenge. And this is a company that reduces the cost of feeding and it feeds the fish when so they're hungry. It, 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 it the sensor base, it feeds only when they're hungry. So it reduces yeah. the amount of feed you use. You save a huge amount of feed, but yeah. it also has a marketplace where it sells fish. And it cuts out a lot of the middlemen. So it's about efficiencies. It's a company that uses technology to benefit kind of the whole industry by making every step of it much more efficient. And it right. also offers financing from Indonesian institutions directly to farmers. And so really like the biggest problems in aquaculture, feed, financing, and how you sell your fish are all solved through this IoT data company. Yeah. And they're scaling outside of Indonesia? So Indonesia, because it has four and a half million fish farmers, is a pretty massive market opportunity. And so they have 
trialed it in other places and they do have a plan to scale up internationally, but they first want to really own Indonesia. So for yeah. the next probably year, they're going to continue to focus on scaling Indonesia. But I think there are 50,000 farmers that they work with now. And by the end of next year, it's probably t- times 10. That's a great story. So how do you return to investors? I mean, how do you make money? Is it all on the exit strategy? And if it's with exit strategy, do you have defined termination dates? You talked about this patient capital approach, but how does this work with returns to your investors? Um, It's a dividend-based model. We had told investors that when we signed them up that by next year, we'll start to pay out dividends and we are on track to start to pay out dividends. It'll start small, but it'll you know, gain each year and we should start next year by paying out dividends. Even though we are long term, investors can redeem their shares in us at whatever kind of the valuation of those shares is at the time. We have a redemption mechanism where we can raise new monies to buy them out or they can mm-hmm. find someone to sell their shares to directly. And then at the end of the day, we've told our investors this is a cooperative where we're all going to figure out how, where this goes through together. Could you describe like profile of your fund's typical investors? Do they invest with AquaSpark out of passion or because of the returns or both, or maybe it doesn't matter? You know, I think, so we have 300 plus investors from, I think, 30 con- countries. I think it's a pretty mixed profile. We didn't have official cornerstone investors, but if you look at like who we launched this with, they were more leaning toward conservation investors, for sure. They cared about the ocean. But as we've grown, you know, investors that care about the food space, more and more have come into the folds that are from the industry or connected. And in general, investors are starting to get this opportunity. So I think most are probably have some kind of impact lens. Other people see that it's a no-brainer that we need to produce more protein and we need to find better ways to produce protein. And it's going to have a kind of financial advantage at one point. Um, So it's really a mix. We have a couple of mostly family offices and high net worth individuals, a couple Mm -hmm. of institutionals, Louis Dreyfus Company is an investor, um, some smaller institutionals like Stichting Dune, the Dutch postcode lottery, but it's uh, mostly individuals. And I think the reason our investor network is expanding so rapidly at this point is because it's also become a real community of, of doers yeah. and pioneers in this space with us. And we do a lot to engage our investors and we're really on this road together. Yeah. They know it and it's a fun experience. I think that gets lost a lot when we talk about impact and ESG investing. If this is a moment in history, we're all doing different stuff together. Like we're making change, we're building, we're using creativity. It's bonding. It gives you meaning. I think if you ask our investors, most would really just enjoy being a part of what we're building. Yeah. What do you benchmark your returns against? I think we said initially we looked at what the listed aquaculture space was where they were. And we ended up somewhere at, you know, above 20%. And that to us, if it were a kind of above 24%, that would be a, a commercial return in the aquaculture space because we're Dutch. You know, you don't want to overpromise. We said internally, and it's in our documents that we're aiming for 20% or higher returns. But we initially said we expect at least 12% returns. The last couple of years, we've been at about 20%, and that's net of fees. What would be the risks to your investors that would be distinct from any general risks that that investors would have to non-sustainable aquaculture investments? It seems like a no-brainer that the future is going to be sustainable aquaculture because it has to, but a lot of it hasn't been proven yet. And if you look at what people are willing to pay for fish, uh, we're not yet at a place where people are willing to pay a premium across the board. Some are. But for more sustainable practices, we have a lot to prove, a long way to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at like RAS systems, those land-based RES systems got a lot of hype and a lot of investment in some of them recently. We see that those are still having major technology risk. It's just a lot of kind of the real promise around sustainability is unproven. It feels like there's no way we can go but cleaner, greener feed ingredients, what and et cetera. But we don't know where, who's going to win that race yet. We don't know where we're going to end up. We're yeah. hoping to drive. We're hoping to shape and really direct where we end up because we think it's where we need to end up. And it's farming, right? It's farming and it's food production. And so there are all the risks that go along with the, you know, live animals and uh, market acceptance and consumer 
taste and what they're looking for. And I think we're still classified as very risky on the zero to five scale. But a lot of the really early risk is like we have a pretty strong, well-performing portfolio that's pretty grounded in the industry that the risk is actually decreasing. The fund that you're raising right now for the African aquaculture, do you have insight as to what are you targeting? How big is that going to be? And why is that a separate fund? We do see a really different risk profile than what we promised our investors. And not because it's Africa, but because the whole kind of point for this fund, and the only reason we are actually picking one geography for the fund, which we wouldn't do in other geographies, is there's no infrastructure for aquaculture in Africa. So you're really starting from the ground up. Like the farm we invested in Mozambique, they were, you know, building roads, right? Getting permits. And typically when we invest in a farm, we like to invest when they're ready to scale, when they've already shown that they can farm, that the system works and they're ready to just farm more fish. So it's just a different risk profile. We don't have feed being produced there at scale, a seed. None of the industry and framework is there. So the whole point of the fund is to develop that framework. If you had to name the one most important challenge in the VC sustainable investment space right now, what would it be? I mean, it's hard to not say kind of climate, but I would say (laughs) I'd say food production. (laughs) (laughs) What do you know now about sustainable investing that you wish you knew back in 2015 when you actually launched AquaSpark? You know, I'm glad I didn't know a lot back then, to be honest. I think our kind of naive way of looking at what was possible really helped us think ambitiously and put something together that we understood the space as well might have been different at the beginning. And I don't think I realized how nascent it was back then, how little real focused activity there was and how much people are really putting behind pure sustainability. And when we try to get co-investors to sign up for sustainability before a profit, there is really an uncomfortable moment. Like the the world's not in great shape, right? We need to figure out how to move into a future that can support us. And that needs to be first and foremost. And it's great that we have this whole movement toward impact, but there are lots of different definitions of impact. I think we kind of all need to really like step up a bit and kind of do what it takes to get real solutions to help them take off. Can you describe an example of an investment that you were convinced of at the time you invested that it ticked all the boxes, but in the end it didn't maybe turn out exactly the way you thought? And did you learn anything from that experience? We've had one write down so far, and it's in a US CPG company that was really going to take on kind of the promotion of aquaculture, sustainable aquaculture, while selling a product that was really transparent and sustainable from different farms. I actually think we knew it was too early, but we wanted to believe that if we pushed the right levers, we could tip the space into caring more about purchasing and increasing the value of sustainability. And again, it was too early because just systematically, we weren't set up for that. Like the retailer didn't really understand their role. The buyer didn't understand their role. The consumer didn't understand their role. Even now with all that's happened, I think a consumer facing product, getting the consumer to be the one to make the choice. It's still early for that before Mm -hmm. everything helping the product get there and helping the consumer get there. Like the infrastructure or the framework for that, it has been built. I also think, though, and this is in our one, and we still haven't written this off. We're still trying to turn it into something. But in this example, we learned a huge amount about the retail space, about what is possible. It did push the conversation forward. Did it help us get to where we are? Absolutely. Was it a good investment? Not at all. Was the lesson learned that it was too early for retail? Or was the lesson learned that it was too early for the company? No, I think it was too early for what the company was doing. And I think like, had we still wanted to forge forward with it, it would have meant that you need, it would have needed a really ample marketing budget. And I don't think that would have made a great investment, but it would have made the company take off. But that's the problem, right? The economics didn't work out if you wanted to make it what it needed to be. Now the converse of that, maybe an investment that you were skeptical of, or maybe you passed on it, but in the end, it turned out way better than you thought, and you were pleased you invested, or or if you passed on it, maybe you wish you hadn't, and did you learn anything from that? 
Because the companies that we pass on that we're still a little bit excited about or whatever, we stay close to and we stay yeah. connected to. And I also think it's interesting. I remember like agents will say the same thing. When a book they've said no to becomes a bestseller, they don't think twice about it because it wasn't the right fit for them. We want our lives to be like manageable and joyful and feel like we're building. So if we pass on a company, usually it's because it doesn't fit us. I think as far as one that we were skeptical about, I don't have a story of like of something that we didn't believe in that all, all of a sudden it's the next yeah. big thing or anything close to that. Well, you didn't leave any money on the table then. If someone wants to get into the sustainable VC agritech investing space, how would you advise them to get into the business? There's the so many great events like Rethink, and there's so many great events focused on that space right now. And there are a number of kind of dedicated funds, not just us, thinking through you know a food production and ag and aquatech. I mean, I'd either invest in a fund or create network and create connection to it. There are also a number of accelerators now, which is a great opportunity. We have an aquaculture accelerator in our portfolio, but they're really early stage companies and they're looking usually for mentorship and other ways of helping beyond just capital. It's a great way to get into the space and be a part of it. Amy, you have a really impressive story, amazing vision. I didn't know really anything about the aquaculture industry prior to boning up for our discussion. I wish you all the best and good luck with you and with your new fund. Thank you for everything and we'll be in touch. (laughs) Cheers. Bye-bye now. Bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please do me a favor and hit the like button and subscribe to receive future episodes. You can find more interviews, articles, and information on sustainable and responsible investing at our website, SRI360.com. If you enjoyed this interview and you would like to read more lessons learned from world-class SRI investors, get yourself a copy of my book, Sustainable and Responsible Investing 360 Degrees. It's a must read for anyone wanting to know more about investing for positive social, environmental, and ethical impact, all with market returns. These are the stories and tactics of those leading the way as sustainable and responsible investing goes mainstream. Sustainable and Responsible Investing 360 Degrees is now available in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook format wherever books are sold. 